I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Welcome to today's service of worship here at First Presbyterian Church. Whether you're here with us in person, joining us live on Zoom, on YouTube, or radio in the future, we are glad to be together, to be worshiping God together. For those who are here in person, we ask that you grab those pew pads, pass those down, fill those out, let people know who's worshiping with you, and see the new information that we have in those each week. We do extend a special welcome to any visitors that we have. We have some welcome gifts out there in the narthex. If you have not gotten one of those, make sure to grab one of those before we head out today. Today we will be serving, sharing in this holy meal, holy communion, the Eucharistic meal. And as Presbyterians, this table is open to all who believe. So it is not a Presbyterian table. All who believe in Jesus are welcome to share in this meal as we get to that time during the service. Yesterday, we had an amazing day at Feed My Starving Children Mobile Food Pack over at the fairgrounds. It was a day filled with a lot of fun, excitement, and it was a huge success. So we packed 132,192 meals. So we reached the goal, praise God. Kind of put that into perspective for you that is going to feed 362 kids one meal for an entire year so thank you for your support it was great to see many of you there if you would like to contribute you can still contribute financially to that to help pay for all the ingredients that went into that that was a huge success please do continue to be in prayer for all of those meals as they get transported around the world and to go. We'll be sharing other stories and testimonies of how those meals are impacting people in the weeks to come. This time I'd like to invite Sue Baker. I believe Sue has some information about another event coming up, Blood Drive. Good morning. I just want to remind everyone that our church will be hosting a blood drive on Monday, April 29th from 2 until 6. And if you haven't signed up, there are a few ways that you can sign up. You can, on the Wednesday updates, they have a Versity um, notice in there. And then the Versity has a link that you can go to and sign up what time you would like to donate. Then there's also, you can just go directly onto the Versity website and sign up that way. Or um, there's a computer on the table in the narthex and you can sign up that way as well. I'll be out there too if you need some help. So please consider donating. It is the gift of life. So thank you. I invite Mary Ellen to come up and share some information about upcoming Growing Connections time. Well, today in Growing Connections, we're going to connect with Mahala's Hope. Uh, some years ago, Sandy Hardy, who is quite a woman, went through recovery herself and realized at the time that it was mostly men and that she felt that she was missing something when she was dealing with her own alcohol abuse. So Sandy is never one to, you know, just sit around. She developed a beautiful, beautiful home, a transition recovery residence called Mahala's Hope. Mahala's Hope was created to fill in the gaps in services in the region. Most of the women who come have been in a 30 day inpatient treatment for alcohol or drug abuse. And when they come out, they're really not ready to go home. Sandy's group represents excellence in dealing with these problems, but also with trauma that can be associated with women's problems that are also deep and need to be looked at. So she prepared a place for return home that has done a beautiful job in cutting down the risk of relapse. It's truly an important goal in our community, I think, to provide life skills 
as well as AODA treatment. So I hope that you will come because Sandy has just retired and we're now hosting at her first uh, discussion or presentation, um, Alicia Mattingly, who is the new director. She's quite young and very um, enthusiastic and I think you would enjoy her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. And last but not least, I invite Joanne to come in and to share some other new information. Good morning. On behalf of the worship team, uh, we thought at our meeting that maybe we needed to have um, the newer Presbyterian hymnal, Glory to God. If you see songs that might say GG next to it, it's from this book. And what Pastor Craig is using and you see on the screen is the Common English Bible. So we have purchased 10 of each. They're on the, in the back of the church on a white bookshelf. And if you uh, would like to use them during the service, that's what they're for, then just return them. But please find one of the worship team members to give them feedback if there are not enough and we find an empty bookcase and people going, ooh, we would order some more, okay? But please give us the feedback, otherwise we don't know. But there are 10 for your use uh, anytime during the service. As I drop them. Thank you. Let us prepare our hearts for worship as the light of Christ is brought in and as we are entered into this time of worship with the ringing of the bells. Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. <clears throat> what great joy we have. Our Lord is risen. Believe with your whole heart in the miracle of resurrection. We open our hearts to the good news of God's faithfulness to us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us pray. Lord of resurrection surprises, open our hearts this day to the presence of Jesus Christ. Erase our excuses for unbelief and exchange them for strong witness to the power of your mercy and love. Give us courage and challenge us to walk the path of discipleship, knowing that Jesus is present with us, leading and guiding our steps. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Thank you. 
How often we have heard the good news of forgiveness and restoration, yet we are still reluctant to believe. God offers us new life, yet we are afraid to let go of the old. Let us confess our darts and fears to the one who waits to make us whole. Let us pray. Patient Lord, you wait for us to understand. You wait for us to remove the blinders of prejudice, fear, unbelief, confusion. You have offered to us the greatest miracle of all time, the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. We sang and celebrated last Sunday, but a week has passed. We have slid back into our old ways of perceiving your presence and love. Now please take a few moments for your own silent confession. Shake us up, Lord. Shake us up and cause us to look with new eyes on our Savior, who came that we might have life, abundantly serving all who are in need. Forgive our stubbornness and our complacency. Reach out to us so that we may reach out with healing love to others. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let the stone of ignorance, stubbornness, and fear be rolled away from our hearts. Celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Know that his love is poured out for you, for your healing. Be at peace and rejoice. Amen. The peace of Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with others. be seated. Our first Bible reading today is taken from Psalm 133, and I'm using the Common English Bible version. If you want to follow in the Pew Bible, it's found on page 575. <clears throat> Look at how good and pleasing it is when families live together as one. It is like expensive oil poured over the head, running down into the beard, Aaron's beard, which extended over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon, streaming down into the mountains of Zion, because it is there 
that the Lord has commanded the blessing, everlasting life. The gospel reading prescribed to us by the Revised Common Lectionary for today comes from John's Gospel, 20th chapter. This is right after the resurrection. It was still the first day of the week, that evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we've seen Jesus. But Thomas replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hand, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus replied, Do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing, you will have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jennifer, children's. I'd like to invite the children to come forward. All right. So have you ever had questions? Anybody here ever have a question that you're not sure about? I have lots of questions. You have lots of questions? You know, Grown-ups have lots of questions, too. The disciples, they were a little bit afraid. Have you ever been a little bit afraid or a lot afraid? Lots of things can make us afraid. So they were locked up in the room, and they weren't sure what to do, but they were sure they were afraid because they didn't know what was gonna happen. They didn't understand what was all happening. Jesus told them things, but they weren't really sure that that was gonna happen, and now it happened, and now they're not sure if that was really what was gonna happen, and they were really kind of anxious about that. So while they were in the locked room, Jesus just appeared. But who wasn't there? Do you remember who wasn't there? What his name was? It was Thomas. Sometimes people say doubting Thomas, but Thomas had some questions. It's not that he did something wrong. He had questions. He wasn't sure what was happening. He wanted to know some answers. When Jesus was with the disciples, they got to see him and they got to touch him and they got to know that he was okay. And then Thomas came back and he missed the whole thing. Have you ever missed out on something? Yeah. And you have questions. Who was there? What happened? I know if you have a mom, she'll ask all those questions. Who was there? What did they say? What happened? Want the whole report. Thomas had lots of questions. So Jesus, was he upset that Thomas had questions? No. 
Thomas, un Thomas had questions and Jesus, I understand you've got questions. And he's happy to answer our questions. Jesus is happy to answer our questions. So Thomas said, Jesus, I have these questions. He didn't even have to say those words out loud because Jesus knew. And Jesus came to see Thomas. You know, that kind of helps me out because I have questions sometimes. Sometimes I'm not sure what to do. Sometimes I'm not sure what's going on. So I'm sure you have some questions too, and I know all the grown-ups do too. But what's really cool to know is that Jesus is there to answer our questions, right? We can go to God, and God will put people in our lives that will help us to find out those answers. And that's pretty good to know because on those days when we're lonely or afraid or anxious, we know that we can come to God and God will help us with those questions. So no more doubting, Thomas. We're going to be questioning Thomas, right? Lots of questions. Because when we have questions, we learn. And that's what we want to do is learn what God has in store for us. So let's take a time right now and let's say a prayer. Loving and gracious God, we thank you so much for the gifts that you pour out on us each and every day. We thank you for the love that you give to us. We thank you for the house that we live in, the food that we eat, the family that we have, the friends. We thank you for all the people that you put into our lives that help us learn more about you and more about your love. And we just ask that you would help us to remember it's okay to have questions. It's okay to not know, um, be sure about what's going on because we know that we have that uh, those answers in you. We need to look to you and to open our hearts to listen to your answers. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's children said, amen. We all do have questions. That is how I approach every Sunday, every scripture. To be able to say, what are some of those questions that come up in the midst of it? That is how we are to approach scripture and approach each and every day of our life. Is to be asking those deep questions like Thomas. Let us open with prayer. Lord, there are many questions in our hearts. There are many certainties that we think we have the answers for, and yet we pray at this time that you would open our hearts to be sensitive to your Spirit's leading, to be able to set aside some of those assurances that maybe we've put too much emphasis on so that we might be able to be like Thomas and to ask those tough questions, that we might be like Peter, willing to change and to see the new ways in which you are at work. Be with us this day. Allow the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, to be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So popular verses, as Jennifer said, 24, 25, Thomas, called Didymus, which means the twin, one of the 12 disciples. He wasn't with the disciples when Jesus showed up. The other disciples, hey, we saw Jesus. His heart must have sunk. We don't know where Thomas was. We can come up with all sorts of ideas. Have you ever been in those situations where you're like, oh, how did I miss that? Thomas gives that famous line, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger into the wounds, I won't believe. And so there we get that nickname, as Jennifer said, Doubting Thomas. Now the root word in that Greek text used to come up with believe or disbelief is pistos. It means faith. It's not just this cognitive belief. It's not just a neck up. It's something deeper. To believe is to have 
faith, active faith. This form of belief is being persuaded by God as to what is trustworthy. To believe is to trust in God's promises, actively trusting in God's promises, especially when we have those questions. Now, I read this passage more as Thomas claiming a promise of truth that he knew about Jesus. Thomas knew that Jesus wouldn't treat him any differently than the rest of the disciples. He wouldn't refuse Thomas to be able to have that same encounter experience that the other disciples did. And yet, that's where he found himself. He had questions. But this testimony that Thomas gives in this passage, it's far more than just that cognitive belief. He's modeling for us a different way of believing, a different way of living out our faith, a deeper theological way of believing that Jesus is truly God. In one of the brief homilies that Pope Benedict XVI gave, he stated, based on this text, he said, basically, from these words emerges the conviction that Jesus can now be recognized by his wounds rather than by his face. Thomas holds that the signs that confirm Jesus' identity are now above all his wounds, in which he reveals to us how much he loved us. We want to see Jesus. We want to encounter Jesus. And we all have those images of Jesus, those graven images that we're not supposed to have, but yet we do. We all have a certain perception of who Jesus is, and typically it's putting a face. That's how we get to know one another. Jesus, the Son of God, from what Benedict XVI says, and I agree, should now be recognized by his wounds rather than just his face. Now, most of us prefer to form our faith in Jesus around all those nice, comforting, pleasant aspects about Jesus. So kind, so loving, he heals people. We like to focus on all those positive things. But Thomas teaches us the importance of naming those death moments in our lives that I've talked about the last couple of times together. We need to be more comfortable with naming those awkward, painful, dark death moments in our life. So that we're not only connected to Jesus in his death moment, but then also we're connected to Jesus' resurrection and the new life that Jesus has for us. That is why we need to go through and connect with those painful moments, even though we don't really want to. When Jesus did appear to Thomas and the other disciples, he said to Thomas, here, put your finger here. No more disbelief. Believe. And then we have what I believe is the strongest point of this entire passage, a verse that I think should be used to describe Thomas rather than doubting Thomas. Thomas responded to Jesus by saying, my Lord and my God. Seems simple. And for most of us, we probably just hear, oh, my Lord, my God. Okay, yeah, that. And we just keep right on reading. But what does that really mean? What did that mean to Thomas? It's one of the clearest declarations of Jesus' divinity. Jesus was fully human, but he was also fully divine. This is testifying Thomas. Thomas testifies to his faith in Jesus, his faith in God, believing strongly that Jesus would never abandon him, would never leave him, forsake him. Thomas is the one who testifies that we are to know Jesus by his wounds. Now, Peter, he's the one who consistently reacts in ways that Jesus actually has to rebuke him. Jesus refers to some of his actions as being from Satan. And yet, the church tends to view Peter as, oh, he's such a much better disciple than Thomas. Maybe because there's a lot more written about Peter than there is about Thomas. And yeah, Jesus does call Peter the rock upon which I will build my church. So that makes sense. But yet we allow Thomas to be marginalized and 
We don't really look at him too much. We know less about Thomas. We don't know anything about his call to be a disciple. He just sort of appears in the listing of the disciples. But there are two other key moments in John's Gospel that give us a deeper insight into Thomas's testimony, his story. Back in John chapter 11, Jesus hears about the death of his friend Lazarus. And the religious leaders are out to get Jesus. They're trying to trap him. They want to stone him. They want to get rid of him. But Jesus looks at his disciples. He says, hey, let's head back to Judea. Thomas and the disciples look at him and they're like, uh, that's not a real smart thing. It's kind of dangerous. One of the disciples says, Rabbi, the Jewish opposition wants to stone you, but you want to go back? Now, remember, this is just before Jesus' triumphant entry, before the final week of his life. And in that moment, Thomas looks to the other disciples. He's like, let us go too, so that we may die with Jesus. Now, part of me has wondered, is this just sarcasm? Is he like, oh, yeah, let's all go back there. Let's all get killed. Why not? Fun time, right? I don't know what that is entirely. I think Thomas is truly willing to follow Jesus, even to the point if it means death. I believe Thomas was willing, fully willing, to die because he believed in all that Jesus had taught them, all that Jesus had told them. See, Jesus had been teaching them that he was to be handed over to die, he would be crucified, he'd be resurrected. They didn't fully understand it all. They had a lot of questions about it, but yet Jesus had taught them so many things about who he is. And over these next several weeks of the Easter season, we're going to be looking at several of these statements about who is Jesus and who is Jesus for us. We're going to be learning more about who we are as believers, gathering together so that we might be able to have a faithful testimony like Thomas did. Thomas was willing to die. But there's also another important part of Thomas's testimony that we need to keep in mind. Even though Thomas had this deep faith, in the final chapters of John's Gospel, final chapter, we see Thomas maybe still wrestling with some of these questions. He's quietly staying with the other disciples. He hasn't run off. But in the opening verses of the 21st chapter of John's Gospel, we read, Later, Jesus himself appeared again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana, they're all together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. And they said, we'll go with you. They were all kind of lost, confused. They all had questions. They didn't know what to do without Jesus. And so they went back to what they thought would be a normal life, the life they had been called from. They said, we're going to go fishing. Now, we aren't told that Thomas said those exact words, we'll go with you but we know that Thomas was with them. These disciples, the majority of the 12, they followed Peter's lead to go fishing. The testimony that follows, the testimony of Peter's guilty memories of denial when Jesus appeared to them on the shoreline and shared a meal with him and washed away all of that pain of Peter's denial the night that Jesus was crucified. That passage is one of my favorites, but it's going to have to wait for another day. What's important for us today about that portion of Thomas's testimony is he was present with the disciples. As together they processed the grief of Jesus' death, the questions they had about what did it mean for their future. Even after Jesus had appeared to them a few times, they were still sorting through what does this mean, and how do we live our faith? We don't know 
how Thomas was called. We don't know what Thomas did for an occupation before. We don't know what he did after. What we do know is that Thomas gave one of the most powerful testimonies of who Jesus is. My Lord and my God. Well, it seems kind of light. It's likely a connection to Thomas's experience when Jesus shared that holy meal that we have come to call the Last Supper with his disciples. In the 14th chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus said to his disciples that night, trust me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I believe Thomas took those words to heart. He wrestled with them. What do they mean? And in that moment when he encountered the resurrected Jesus, all came together. He said, my Lord and my God, just as the Father was connected to Jesus and Jesus to God, they were all mysteriously connected to Thomas. There was a mystical union taking place that could not be articulated other than my Lord and my God. I am with you. You are with the Father. The Father is with us. This was the faith of Thomas. This is what Thomas believed. He had questions about how it was to be lived out. But this is the way that Thomas' faith continued to grow, continued to connect with the rest of the world. Tradition has it that Thomas became a great missionary, maybe even against his own desires. Thomas wrote the gospel, not included in our canon of scripture. But Thomas continued to live out his faith. Faith is not a state of being. Faith is a process of becoming what God is calling us to be in relationship to God, to other people, to the world. To be that mystical union, that spiritual connection that the world is longing for. That is what faith is to be. In the words of Carl Dodd Jr., an Episcopal priest and son of a Baptist minister, he wrote these words, faith begins by letting go, giving up what had seemed sure, taking risks and pressing on, though the way feels less secure. Pilgrimage both right and odd, trusting all our life to God. As we prepare to share this holy meal, as Jesus commands us to do, may our testimony become like that of Thomas. May we experience a mysterious encounter with the risen Christ as we break bread, being fully persuaded by God through the power of the Holy Spirit to grow in the faith of Jesus' presence with us, to grow in the faith of being in the presence of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not just here, but at all times, in the everyday, the ordinary, of all of our life. My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Amen. Amen. Let us respond to God's word as we sing together. Faith begins by letting go. Those words that I just read, penned by Carl Daw Jr. and put to music.
invite you to stand as you are able as we affirm the faith of our baptism as written in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. I invite prepare for worship. We're doing the song first. I've gotten this mixed up a couple of times in the past. I'm trying to get it right here today. We doing music first or as part of the offering? I invite the ushers to come forward then. I try not to make a mistake and then I still make a mistake. We're all human, right? Let us offer back a portion of that which God has entrusted to us. May we offer our very selves as the plates come through.
Lord, we thank you for the many gifts that you have offered to us, the many things that you have entrusted to us, physical things, emotional things, the gifts of our life that we are to be giving to others. Take these, our tithes and our offerings, multiply them to further your kingdom here on earth. Amen. You may be seated as we sing a song to prepare our hearts to share this holy meal of Holy Communion. Number 507, come to the table of grace. In our busy worlds, more and more people do not sit down and share a meal together around a table. This is a precious time to be able to gather together with God's people and to know that we are not the only ones, that there are people around the world that gather around this same table, the church universal. This is not a Presbyterian table. This is the Lord's table. It is open to all who believe in Jesus Christ. It is open for children who have been trained, who know the meaning of this in as much as they are able to, in as much as any of us are able to comprehend the mystery of this meal, we are invited to partake in God's grace. Today we'll be sharing by intinction. We'll begin with the outside sets of pews to come forward and to take or to hold out your hands. The server will place some bread in your hand. Then you may dip it in the cup. You may go back to the side if you prefer. We do have trays with prepackaged communion if you, prepare, if you prefer to not do intinction. We respect that. Also, and then we will have the two center pews come down the center aisle and return by the sides. While communion is being served by intention here, there will be a couple of people walking around serving. Anyone who prefers to stay seated in your pew as they come around, please get their attention, let them know. It may take a little bit for them to wander around to take care of all of those who are serving in many different ways to lead this service, those who are remaining in the pews. And then we will close in prayer. Let us begin 
with a great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O God, for you have raised Jesus Christ from the dead. By your grace, we have life in his name. From the very beginning, the word of life was with you, creating everything in earth and heaven. You rescued your people from death and called them to follow you, walking in the light. You sent your word of life into the world in your son, Jesus, shining your light into our darkness that the sins of the world might be forgiven. Though he was killed by those who walk in darkness, you raised him to resurrection life, and now he lives at your side forever, advocating mercy for all who stumble into sin. Through his great grace, we are able to live in fellowship with you and in peace with one another, in one heart and mind. Loving God, Recalling now Christ's death and resurrection, we ask you to accept this, our sacrifice of praise. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these, your gifts of loaf and cup, that we may be fed with the body and blood of your Son, we may be filled with your life and goodness. Strengthen us to do your work and to be your body in the world. Unite us in Christ and give us your peace. Therefore, with our hearts lifted high, we offer you thanks and praise at all times through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever, uniting our voices together as one, praying the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples and he shared this meal. Taking the bread, he blessed God, gave thanks, and said, this is my body. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the meal, he took the cup. Again, he blessed God, gave thanks, and said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. To take, drink, do this in remembrance of me. As often as we share this bread and this cup, we do proclaim Christ's death until he comes again in final glory. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Invite the servers to come forward. I will serve the servers first, and then the ushers will invite you to come forward and to share in this holy meal.
Let us pray. God of promise, we give you thanks because you gloriously raised your son, Jesus, from the dead, powerfully blew your peace into all creation through your Holy Spirit, and continually give us new life in Jesus' name. We lift up all of those 
around the world and those here in the midst of us who are battling illness, those who are in the midst of conflict and war, those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Lord, in the midst of our lives, allow us to be able to give testimony, but allow us also to hear the testimony of your people around the world who are crying out with praise and thanks in the midst of unbelievably painful situations. Allow us to ask those tough questions and in asking, allow our faith to grow. Together all God's people said, Amen. I invite you to stand for our sending him. Give to the winds thy fears. As you go out into the world, minister to one another, to minister to those whom God places in your path. May you go out into the world with a testimony that says, Jesus is my Lord and my God, that we are all united together as one no matter where God leads us to, and that we are united together with the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go and share your testimony and hear the testimony of others with new, fresh ears. Amen. Amen.